So welcome back. Uh, the topic of the lecture this afternoon is epistemic territory in conversation. So as we were saying this morning, there are many animals that signal each other. Many animals have communicative exchanges. We're the only animal that sends also signals about the signaling itself, not just signals about the world. Uh, so, and our, our exchanges are genuinely interactive in the sense that we correct each other, we question each other, uh, we, we ask for clarification uh, if there's a point we didn't quite understand. And again, I underscore uh, uh, the welcome for any of you to stop me and ask me to clarify something. If I say something that you don't quite hear or, uh, or don't quite understand and you want clarification in the moment. Um, we're typically doing this without conscious or strategic effort. So you can be, for example, unaware of the meaning of a signal like, oh, despite the fact that you're using it, using it intelligently and flexibly in the course of interactive conversations all the time. Um, we have a variety of tools that we're using to manage the joint social action of conversation, everything from eye contact and smiling um, to these overt epistemic markers. Conversations coordinate people uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, in this series of lectures, I'm specifically focusing on epistemic coordination. So when you think of epistemic coordination, think about what we should share. Um, my starting point for this is thinking of epistemic differences between individuals. So each person's experience of the world is a product of two factors. On the one hand, uh, the rich causal structure of reality itself, and on the other hand, the trajectory that that particular individual takes through reality. And as different individuals, each of us takes a slightly different path uh, through our shared world. And as a result, there will be things that each of us know about reality uh, which are distinct or private that other people don't know, you know, the contents of your own, of your own pockets. Um, so ideally, if we could share our private knowledge, share those aspects of reality to which we've had access and other people haven't, uh, we could collectively benefit a great deal from this. In order to do this efficiently, it looks like we have to keep track of disparities in our epistemic position versus the epistemic position of the other people that we're encountering. I'm going to be wasting your time if I keep telling you a lot of things that you already know. Uh, I'm going to be wasting both of our times if I ask you questions um, that you're unable to answer. So ideally, our conversations should be guided by some kind of map of our, uh, of our epistemic territory, of each conversational participant's epistemic territory. I should say I'm going to be using this phrase, epistemic territory, which I'm borrowing from the sociologist John Heritage. I'll be using it in a very simple way. I'll just be using it to refer to what we know. Your epistemic territory is a set of propositions that you know, if you like. Um, we'll see that people's perceived epistemic territory might not always line up exactly with their actual epistemic territory. So you may think of me as, or in, even instinctively represent me, as knowing some things that I don't in fact know. Um, you might also instinctively in some situations see me as failing to know some things that I do know. So there's a little bit of a gap between the territory that you recognize or attribute um, to a person and the territory that that person actually has. Uh, again, in this lecture, as, in the, as, as I started this morning, I'm going to be, for present purposes, quite non-skeptical about what territory um, people actually have. So I'll be taking it, for example, as completely unproblematic um, that everyone in the room knows that there's a <coughs> lectern right here. That's in our shared epistemic territory here in this room. And it's not within the epistemic territory of anyone in Afghanistan, unless, of course, they're watching this on the video later. OK. Um, so ideally, in a sense, you'd love to know precisely for each person which range of questions they can and cannot answer knowledgeably. It'd be great to kind of know that in advance. If you had a perfect map of all the disparities between your own epistemic position and the epistemic position of any potential conversational participant. Um, of course, we don't seem to have that. Um, 
What we seem to do is um, update our maps of people's epistemic territory uh, interactively during cooperative conversation, even as we are at the same time jointly updating our shared picture of the reality. So you will sometimes ask someone a question, uh, having represented them as knowing the answer, having put them as having the answer to that question within their territory. Uh, and what comes out of it is not that you can now map an extra part of reality because you get an answer from them, but what comes out of it is that they'll answer that they don't know. And so you have to revise your map of that person's uh, epistemic territory. So there's two tasks that we're executing all the time in conversation. Um, we're updating our picture of what reality is like, and we're updating our picture of the epistemic position of the people that we're conversing cooperatively with. So uh, I mentioned that heritage is the originator of this expression, epistemic territory. And the way he sees it, uh, the territory that you assign somebody is a zone in which you're seeing them as knowledgeable. It's also a zone in which you're going to take what they say on trust. You're not going to demand an argument for it, demand reasons for it. That's, in fact, more or less definitive for heritage of what it is to assign somebody a certain stretch of epistemic territory. So the recognized territory, um, the way heritage looks at it, concerns a whole zone of things that are just close to home. Uh, for most of us, he gets kind of an open-ended list. Um, so it includes people's experiences, recent memories, hobbies, expertise, feelings, friends, families, jobs, pets, plans. So it's sort of very safe conversational topics. Um, you ask somebody how they're doing. They give you an answer. Uh, and, and you don't usually demand a lot of reasons for that because your instinct will be to see their own immediate feelings as lying within that. Uh, uncontroversial territory in which you take them to have, uh, to have knowledge. In this zone, it seems, it's not that you see people as knowing on the basis of first, evaluating that they have a certain belief, second, evaluating that this belief is true, and then adding whatever other factors are needed beyond true belief to add up to the state of knowledge. Um, Rather, you, uh, as long as you're restricted to a topic that's within the instinctive epistemic territory of the other conversational participant, um, you're going to just take what they say is true because of a prior allocation of epistemic territory, because you see them as knowing it. And one sort of helpful way to think of this prior allocation of epistemic territory is not in terms of um, of straightforward propositional knowledge of the form S knows that P, um, but in terms of questions that they can knowledgeably answer. Uh, so uh, so um, let's take somebody with whom I did not, I did not have lunch with, with Brian today. Um, but I take the question of whether Brian had coffee with his lunch uh, as a question which is squarely within his, uh, within his epistemic territory. Um, whatever he says on this question, uh, if we weren't, of course, in the context of an epistemological example where it's become suddenly very problematic what he might say about this, but whatever he would naturally say on this question, uh, if we weren't being self-conscious about it, is something that I would take um, to just update my map of reality as something that I would take as true because I see him as knowing it. Um, okay. Uh, but I don't need to know in advance uh, the truth of the question in order to assign it to, I don't need to know in advance what the true answer of the question is in order to assign um, that, uh, that, that area to his epistemic territory. It's just within this sort of familiar realm um, that Heritage is sketching out where we don't generally ask people to give reasons. We're going to later maybe see some uh, difficulties with this and want to raise some questions about how that how that zone gets, uh, gets attributed. Um, but for now, let's just, uh, let's just go with it. There's something about the idea of epistemic territory which is not uniquely human. Um, so other animals do also seem to have some capacity to distinguish between states of knowledge and ignorance uh, in their conspecifics. So monkeys and apes, in particular, are good at keeping track 
of the states of knowledge of other creatures when they're in competitive contexts. So there's been some very interesting experimental work on this in the last couple decades. Um, taking advantage of the fact that a subordinate animal will not challenge a dominant animal for food. Uh, what is often done in these, uh, in these experiments is you have a subordinate animal who witnesses a desirable item of food being hidden in the presence of a dominant competitor. Both animals are restrained from entering the arena where the food is being, is being hidden. And uh, that dominant animal uh, is then maybe taken away uh, and brought back. And the subordinate is released into the arena and given a chance to either go for the food or not. They're allowed to do this before the dominance cage is opened. So they can't just engage in behavior reading to see whether that dominant animal will or won't go for the food at that location. They have to anticipate what the dominant is likely to do. Uh, and subordinate animals will go for the food uh, only if the dominant did not have a clear view of the food being placed there during the time of baiting. Now, sometimes it was thought, OK, maybe what the subordinate animal is doing is it's registering any food that was witnessed by a dominant animal as going into a certain location. It's registering that food as being unsafe or somehow having the evil eye placed upon it. So that food can't be pursued. And then this wouldn't really be a mental state attribution to the dominant animal. Um, it would be more like a monadic predicate of the food. As soon as food has been seen by a dominant, um, it's dangerous to pursue it. Um, that explanation has been ruled out by, for example, taking the original dominant animal, which had seen the food, taking that animal away and bringing a different particular individual dominant animal uh, into the other pen. Uh, if you do that kind of switch of subjects, switch of protagonist, then the subordinate animal will go for the food. It'll treat this new coming dominant animal appropriately as ignorant, as not, having, as not having seen the food. So whatever the subordinate animal is doing, it's taking what seems to be some kind of epistemic state and pinning it on a particular, uh, a particular individual. Um, one of the things that's interesting about this is that in this kind of experiment, the primates aren't just sensitive to where is that other animal looking right now. Um, they're sensitive to the past track record that the other animal has. So they're sensitive to stored mental states, which can last over time uh, and, control, uh, and control behavior. Um, so as I mentioned in passing this morning, non-human primates distinguish between knowledge and ignorance. Um, they don't seem to distinguish between true and false belief. Um, this is true both of uh, chimpanzees and of, uh, and of monkeys. So um, Laurie Santos, in particular, has done some really interesting work with rhesus monkeys on exactly this point. Um, so it kind of goes like this. If you know the false belief task, an object is placed in one location, uh, maybe in the presence of another, in the presence of another animal. When that other animal is away or its back is turned, it's moved over to another location. Uh, and then when the other animal comes back, the witnessing, the witnessing animal on this side, the subject, um, will show anticipatory looking towards uh, one of the two locations. Um, if the object is just placed in location A and left there while the other animal is taken away and comes back, um, a chimpanzee or a rhesus macaque will show anticipatory looking towards location A when the knowledgeable animal comes back. Because the rhesus monkey has seen that the other animal has seen that it's in this location and intelligently attributes a state of knowledge that this object is in this location to the competitor. Um, if the object is moved to the other location, a six-year-old child who's capable of passing a false belief test will show anticipatory looking towards this first spot. Uh, if the move happened while the competitor was away, 
um, because a six-year-old child can recognize that competitor last saw it here, so that competitor will probably go for it here where she last saw it. Monkeys and chimpanzees, by contrast, um, show random anticipatory looking towards the two positions. Um, they do not, monkeys in particular, there's actually a little bit of doubt about some chimpanzees in this case, but they, they do, um, they, they will rep represent uh, the lack of a state of knowledge. They will not anticipate that the returning agent will go for the, for the object either where it is now or where it was last seen. They show no expectation about where that returning agent will go. The most interesting condition here, though, is a condition in which both animals see an object being placed in one location. And then while the dominant animal is away, the object is just lifted from that very location and placed right back. So you might think this would be a manipulation which would make location A very salient um, to the subject animal. Uh, when the dominant animal returns, the subject animal, again, shows no preference towards either of the locations, as if treating that returning dominant animal just as ignorant about where the object is. What's really striking about this is if you had just left the grape or whatever the object is in this cup without moving it up and down, if you just left it there, uh, the monkey who's able to represent states of knowledge would anticipate that the returning competitor will look at it, look for it in this very location. As soon as you move it away, even if you move it back, it looks like that representation of knowledge just gets, gets shattered, gets broken. Um, so it's not, it's not sustained, even though the returning animal should at this point have the true belief um, that the target object is in, is in location A, the um, mental state attributing non-human primate doesn't seem to be able to represent it that way. Um, this is one of the ways in which we are, we are different. There's another way in which we're different, though, which happens already at the level of knowledge and not even at the level of belief attribution, which is the following, that we, as human beings, can not only attribute knowledge, but we can recognize knowledge attributions. That is, we can recognize that other people see us as knowing. Uh, and this is something that starts emerging in our capacity for joint attention. Uh, right around the end of the first year of life. So human infants start following the gaze of their caregivers um, very early, between three and six months. Uh, and they develop much deeper gaze sensitivity around 10 to 12 months. So at that point, they can start differentiating between a turn of the head and a turn of the eyes, and really see the turn of the eyes as being what's, uh, what's most important. Uh, and around that time, they start gaining the capacity to not only align their gaze on another object with another agent, but also check back with that other agent to see that this state of awareness is, uh, is shared. Uh, and that's something which just has to do with the state of knowledge. It's not yet state of invol involving any belief attribution, um, but it's something that human beings do that other animals, uh, other animals don't. Um, this is something that Michael Tomasello has made a great deal out of. Uh, and here's Tomasello's proposal for why we are so different um, from the other animals. If you look at other animals, initial studies of non-human primates had suggested that they were actually incapable of uh, attributing states of knowledge because initial studies were actually geared towards cooperative, helpful contexts in which you had either a knowledgeable or an ignorant clue giver pointing out very helpfully um, to the animal, for example, where uh, hidden food was located. Uh, uh, Non-human primates were very bad at uh, executing those tasks successfully. Non-human primates only started to show the depth of their capacity to register the mental states of others when they were put into competitive contexts where they had to fight with each other, outcompete each other for a monopolizable resource. Um, birds, like ravens, are also very good at attributing the mental states, uh, attributing mental states to others when they're put in a position where they have to hide food safe from the prying eyes of a competitor. Um, that's not a cooperative situation. 
We human beings, on the other hand, seem to use our mental state attribution uh, in a cooperative fashion. That is, there are things we want uh, to show others. There's things we want other people to know um, cooperatively and constructively. And Thomas Sowell's theory, of course, is that this is what makes human beings so much more powerful than the other species, is that we can act in concert with each other. We can engage in joint actions. We can do things cooperatively. Um, that other animals are barred from doing. Other animals can, of course, cooperate. You have social inse insects, for example, who can you know, build hives and so on together. Um, but their cooperation is um, pre-structured by their uh, genetically encoded instincts. Our cooperation is, uh, is flexible. And it is something that we can negotiate on the fly. Uh, for example, in conversations, where we're figuring out what to do uh, and what would be the best solution to a problem. Um, so here's kind of the core of one of the differences that you get when you have cooperative as opposed to competitive mental state attribution. This is Tomasello. Whereas during competition, individuals read the minds of their competitors against the competitor's will. So when we're competing, I want to conceal my mental states from you. We're playing poker with, against each other I don't want you to see on my face whether I've got a good hand or not. Or you know, we're competing for a food resource. I don't want you to see on my face um, that I know that the food is in a certain location. right? In cooperation and coordination, by contrast, individuals want their partner to read their minds. When we're cooperating and coordinating, I do everything I can um, to display or advertise my mental states to you to facilitate this process. So remember I said, Human beings have a sort of unique capacity that we're not, we're not just signaling each other about the world. We're also signaling each other about uh, the reception of signals, right? This is something uniquely cooperative um, that we are doing. Um, as Tom Sellers pointed out, there are a number of differences in human beings down to anatomical differences separating us from other animals that make our mental states uh, advertised to each other. Um, so unlike the eyes of other primates, the human eye has an iris surrounded by a very much contrasting white sclera, making it easy to tell, even at a distance, uh, what direction your gaze is following it, is following it. So our eye direction, which is a signal of our attention, presumably some kind of signal of our epistemic state, um, is very easy to read, uh, and that's not the case for, uh, for other animals. OK, so, um, so let's come back for a second to this idea of having some kind of default epistemic territory that you assign to others. If you have the notion that um, we are a cooperative species, we're trying to share what we know, um, there are great advantages to recognizing the people that we encounter as each having a distinct, but perhaps to some extent, stereotyped or predictable uh, epistemic territory. If we were completely credulous to others, uh, willing to believe absolutely anything they say on absolutely any topic, um, this would be risky in a variety of ways, right? I mean, it'd be risky not only in the sort of degenerate cases where people exploit the generally cooperative character of communication to defect into maybe lying for strategic advantage. Um, but it would also be risky because there might be some topics in which you should be expected to know less than I do, and some topics where I should be expected to know less than you do. Um, it helps, in a sense, that we have a sort of prior assignment of greater expertise for some uh, topics to some persons. Uh, so complete credulity would be risky. Complete incredulity or resistance to believe what other people would say um, would, of course, bar us from learning from others, and that would be a problem. Um, we could be cautious with respect to whatever anyone else might tell us. Um, it seems like that might be inefficient. So if you were always sort of demanding arguments and reasons from everybody, that would be inefficient. It would also be restrictive. Um, in a number of ways. So, so there's some, some kind of um, prima facie advantages to having this default recognition of epistemic territory. 
Um, when we move into actual dynamic conversations, we're not stuck with a default recognition of epistemic territory. Um, we have live and continually updated representations of epistemic territory. And now we're going to get back into um, talking a little bit about the literature from conversational analysis. All right. Um, so we've got a bunch of different mechanisms for tracking and signaling knowledge possession and knowledge transfer. Um, this morning, I talked a little bit about the marker O, this epistemic change of state marker, um, which indicates knowledge gain or the revival to awareness of stored knowledge. You can think of it as being a signal in the same sense that the white-tailed deer's uh, tail flash here is, 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 is a signal. It's a signal which can be triggered by things that aren't actually knowledge, um, that just seem to be knowledge, just as the white-tailed deer's flash can be triggered by things that weren't actually danger, um, but just seemed to be danger, so we can be subject to certain kinds of false alarms. But the underlying function of it uh, is to signal uh, knowledge gain or revival. We produce it in a variety of different contingencies, both responding to things outside the conversation, things within the conversation, uh, and we use it as a, uh, as a success signal. Again, as I said this morning, um, it, can be, it can be triggered by uh, things that just seem to be moments of knowledge acquisition or revival, and we can use it deceptively. Um, there's a question of how we start to use this kind of signaling, and um, I'm here going to follow the idea uh, that uh, Sarah Murray and Will Starr have advanced for the way in which we follow things like the Gricean maxims of quantity and manner. So Murray and Starr have argued that we don't follow these uh, in a learned or strategic manner. Um, they're some kind of part of our cultural inheritance. Um, so I like this idea that um, the production of this is they don't apply it specifically to epistemic change of state markers, but I would like to do that, that the production of a marker like O is a self-fulfilling expectation about what agents like us do uh, in particular circumstances. It's something that is usually managed um, through unconscious processes uh, in a fairly automatic fashion. Murray and Starr are actually interested in the larger question of how it is that within conversations, we have these distinct practices of asserting, questioning, and commanding all of which have to be rep recognized by both parties in order to have a successful moment of asserting, questioning, or commanding, in order for that to actually serve its purpose. You have to have both speaker and hearer um, buying into it uh, in some way. Um, they are interested in the idea that any good theory of utterance force is going to have to explain how those different ways in which people interact with each other conversationally can become stable and reproduced ways of coordinating. So in their theory, they're concerned that um, if you have a framework in which all conversational moves are just represented as um, updates in the set of propositions that we are mutually assuming for the purpose of this very conversation, uh, if you have that kind of self-contained theory of what um, utterance force amounts to, uh, it's not clear why we as human beings, uh, or how exactly we benefit from um, this exercise of um, updating sets of propositions that we're mutually assuming for the purpose of this conversation. They think um, if you really want an adequate theory of how these different types of social action that we engage in when we're asserting, questioning, and commanding, how those work, um, you have to look at the larger situation, the larger role that conversation plays in our lives. So in particular, they're interested in the idea that conversations function um, to coordinate agents. Uh, and they say uh, what they're really doing is they're coordinating the beliefs of agents. If you can get into a position where your beliefs and the beliefs of the party that you're interacting with are the same, then you can engage in um, uh, productive joint actions of a type that might be much more powerful than what you could do if you were just stuck 
uh, on your own, unable to, uh, unable to coordinate epistemically with another person. Um, my own view is that an even um, stronger idea would be to see the purposes of conversation as being uh, the sharing or pooling of knowledge. Um, so although it's in many cases advantageous to ad align yourself with another person on the question of what you believe, it's even more advantageous um, if you can uh, not just have shared beliefs that are mutual between you and the other parties, but beliefs which are also in line with the way that the world is. Um, that's going to be even more advantageous. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so we'll see when we then step forward into the uh, back into the conversational analysis literature. It's actually this latter this latter idea that seems to be dominant um, within that literature. Okay, so in particular. Um, let's take two particular social actions that people could engage in, asking and telling. I might want some bit of knowledge from you, or I might want to give you a bit of knowledge. See, that's the way I'm putting it. Another way to put it would be, I might want to know what you believe. What is your state of mind? Or I might want to share my particular belief with you, right? That would be another, another way of putting it. Um, uh, I think, uh, again, although it's often very valuable to know what other agents believe, uh, it's even better if you can extract from them what they know, right? Because then you can update not just your picture of the agent, but your picture of, uh, of what reality is. Now, it might seem like this has a really, really obvious answer uh, in linguistic communication, which is that um, you just wait and see whether they use interrog interrogative syntax or declarative syntax. Uh, in their statement, right? If they use interrogative syntax, then obviously they're asking. Uh, if they use declarative syntax, then obviously they're telling. Weirdly enough, that seems not exactly to be the way we do it, or it's not the way we always do it. Um, so here I'm looking at the work of Tanya Stivers. Um, so in English, about a quarter of the questions that we ask are marked with these classic question words, who, where, what, uh, why. Um, polar questions are just yes or no questions. Um, and those can have interrogative syntax in English, where we invert subject to noun. Did you see, da, da, da. Um, but they can also have declarative syntax. So I can just say, you're coming to dinner uh, with a certain intonation, and you're going to hear that as a question. Um, curiously, though, in fact, I don't need to do that rising intonation in order for you to hear a polar question with declarative syntax as a question. I should say, of course, there are many languages in which um, polar questions only have declarative syntax, so there's never a uh, you know, question of the form, uh, did he arrive, right? I, I believe spoken Italian, um, polar questions only have declarative syntax. Um, but, uh, but in any event, um, with declarative syntax, I was certainly taught in school that you had to have rising intonation at the end of a statement to make it heard as a question. Uh, if you look at the corpus data, that's not true. Only half of declarative questions have that strongly rising intonation. Um, many have weakly rising. And a surprising number, I think it's like 18 20%, have actually falling intonation. And I'll give you a few examples of declarative statements with falling intonation, which are nonetheless heard uh, as questions in a moment. I should also say that when we, make, uh, when we make a move not of questioning but asserting something, it's actually also not uncommon in English to have rising intonation at the end of an assertion. You often do that if you're going to be continuing into, uh, continuing into your next statement. So you don't have the usual falling intonation. You still have rising intonation. Won't necessarily be heard as a question. Typically won't be heard as a question. So what is it that determines whether you hear me as telling you that you're coming to dinner or asking you whether you're coming to dinner? Um, OK. Uh, this was a good question. 
And it's a question that motivated some work um, by Leboff and Fanshell back in the 1970s. Um, and this is actually a place where John Heritage starts his theory of, uh, of epistemic territory. So Leboff and Fanshell distinguish between various types of events that get discussed in conversation. Um, they have a classification of A events and B events. So an A event is something that is known to A but not to B. Uh, so it's inside A's epistemic territory, but not B's. Uh, B event is the converse. And of course, actually, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other types of events that Leboff and Fanchel distinguish. So there's also D events, which are disputed. There's a, whole, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of different types, which we won't get into. We're just interested in the plain, old-fashioned asymmetry of an event which is private to me, unknown to you, um, or vice versa. Um, on the basis of their empirical research, they generated a rule that if I make a statement about an event which is squarely inside your territory and not mine, um, then it will be heard as a request for confirmation. Um, so if I say, you're coming to dinner, I don't have to do the rising intonation in order for you to hear it as a question, because that's something that is deep enough inside your territory. Um, the way that they actually did this was they had face-to-face uh, -face interviews with a whole bunch of subjects about their experiences of life in New York. Uh, and these were scripted interviews where at some point the interviewer was supposed to ask them about burglaries. And because it was the 70s in New York, almost everybody had been burgled or had been broken into. Um, and the interviewer was just cued to, at some point, say, with falling intonation, and you never called the police. And every single one of Leboff and Fanshell's experimental participants responded to that as though it were a question uh, and gave an answer to it. And you can think about how it would be different if, for example, um, you had a similar kind of conversation, but it was a married couple. Uh, who lived together through the whole period, and it was very clear that, that they knew, each knew of their spouse that the police had never been called. Um, and you had somebody just maybe reminding the other, you never called the police, uh, and that might get responded to a bit differently, maybe with some kind of defense of why they never called the police. Whereas in Leibov and Fanshell, when that um, line of dialogue comes out, because it's a statement by A about a B event, B hears it as a question. Uh, and, has to, uh, and has to respond to it. Um, so there's this kind of structure that if I raise a topic, which is understood to be in your territory, not in mine, it's seen as, uh, as an ask. I want to get your knowledge on this topic, even if I'm using declarative syntax, even if I'm using falling intonation. Um, another sort of moment of... Uh, Convergent realization of this is in Anita Pomerantz's work from the 1980s on phishing devices. So this is another way in which you can make a statement and have it be heard as a question. So Pomerantz distinguishes between type one knowledge, uh, which is authoritative. It's a kind of knowledge that you have as a subject actor uh, firsthand. Um, type two knowledge is indirect or distant. Uh, so inference and testimonially grounded knowledge is usually classified as type two. If I witness your actions from a distance, that's also type two knowledge. Um, and you can fish for information, like essentially ask somebody about something, by displaying your type two knowledge of an event in which they were the subject actor, in which they had type one knowledge. So she has a bunch of examples from her transcript. If I say something like, well, you were in room 252 for a long time this afternoon. Uh, or I like the second one. This is testimony of grounded knowledge. And uh, she said that uh, you guys were having a party Friday. I'm not actually telling you something. I'm asking for something. I'm fishing for something, right? Um, there's another sort of classic example of this uh, if uh, if I encounter, uh, I suppose you tell me that your um, sister is coming to town. Um, this is an example from the literature on epistemic modals. Um, you've told me that your sister is coming to town, and then I bump into you on the street with a woman who rather resembles you. I might some say something like, oh, you must be Anita's sister, right? That you must be. Um, the must be, that epistemic modal, indicates that the grounds of my statement are inference. When I say you must be Anita's sister, 
I'm not telling you something that you're, you're a NATO sister, that you, uh, it would be infelicitous for me to tell you what you already know. Um, I'm actually asking you something. And if I say, oh, you must be a NATO sister, um, you are going to be obliged to respond to that as if it was a question. You'll be obliged to, to give me some confirmation or a denial uh, in the event that I'm wrong about who you are. OK. Um, the last source from which, the last source that Heritage credits with his evolution of the notion of epistemic territory is the Japanese linguist Akio Kamio, who has, um, instead of Anita Pomerantz's binary type one, type two distinction between kinds of knowledge, uh, a continuous gradient uh, from zero to one, representing how deeply something is situated within your epistemic territory. Um, so we map both speaker and hearer positions on this gradient. Uh, and what we're really concerned with is relative territorial possession. So the same person um, might make a more direct statement, like summer in Alaska is beautiful, to one person. But they might have to make a more indirect statement. I hear summer in Alaska is beautiful. Um, to somebody who's higher on the gradient than they are with respect to summer in Alaska, right? You can, you can think about how this would go. Japanese in particular is a language which has um, very fine-grained resources for marking those kinds of distinctions. But it was Camus' theory that the same principle applies cross-linguistically. In Heritage's own theory, um, we retain the idea of a spectrum or gradient as opposed to just a binary division between types of knowledge. Uh, but the gradient runs from k minus, which is a state of having no knowledge at all, up to k plus, a state of being fully knowledgeable. Um, and there's a number of different spots along, along that continuum within his theory. Heritage also distinguishes between epistemic stance which is the representation or sometimes misrepresentation of what you know and epistemic status, the underlying truth about what you know. And for various reasons, you can adopt a stance which is at odds with your status. So frequently, for example, in um, pedagogical questioning, you might ask the class a question to which you yourself obviously know the answer, right? But you're adopting that stance of not knowing um, and then you'll notice when you do engage in pedagogical questioning, when you ask the class a question to which you very well know the answer, um, if someone does give an answer, which is the right answer to the question, you're not going to respond with, oh, the way you would if it was a genuine question, right? Um, you'll typically respond with an evaluation. That's right, very good, right? So, so it's not really fooling anybody that you're taking a stance opposed to your status um, because it's understood by all parties um, that you have to act that role. So here's Heritage, Heritage's example. Um, he matches a doctor taking a patient's medical history. And um, she can use full-on interrogative syntax. Are you married? That's the deepest K minus position. She's signaling no knowledge at all of the matter. Uh, it's a question that has to be responded to. She can take a milder. Uh, interrogative status where she puts it on a, a tag question. You're married, aren't you? Uh, and that might be appropriate if she had some prior knowledge of the patient, some suspicion of uh, what their marital status was. But she can actually also say in declarative syntax with falling intonation, you're married. And the patient still has to respond. It's still heard as a question because the one's own marital status is so squarely within one's own uh, epistemic territory. What Heritage takes from this is that because, uh, well, as he puts it, all aspects of clausal morphosyntax are overwhelmed in their significance for action formation by epistemic status. That is, whether I'm using interrogative syntax is not itself something that automatically settles the question of whether I'm questioning or telling you something. Because, for example, I could use interrogative syntax in a rhetorical question, the point of which is to tell you something, right? Or I could use declarative syntax in a context in which I am actually asking you something. How do you interpret what people are saying? You interpret it in light of um, some kind of prior assignment of epistemic status. 
So interactants have to be at all times cognizant of what they take to be the real world distribution of knowledge and rights to knowledge between them as a condition of correctly understanding how clausal utterances are to be interpreted as social actions. So we have a whole table here, which I realize you can't quite read, showing how different types of syntax look different and are understood differently based on a prior attribution of, uh, of knowledge um, between the parties. Um, so you've got to have this sort of fine-grained get fine-grained grasp of epistemic domains and relative epistemic status within those domains. Um, and this seems to make sense if uh, the natural purpose of conversation is this purpose of pooling knowledge. Okay, So we've got this distinction between stance and status. Um, and we've got two possible places um, that you can enter as a conversant. right? So this is heritage again. First, speakers can position themselves in a relatively unknowing or K minus position concerning the, ma the matter at hand, thereby initiating sequences by inviting or eliciting information from a projectedly more knowing or K plus recipient. Alternatively, knowing or K plus speakers can simply initiate talk concerning the matter at hand. Uh, finding a warrant for this conduct by projecting their recipients to be in a relatively unknowing or K-minus position. And we'll often kind of like underscore um, the disparity of the audience. We'll actually say something like, you'll never guess what just happened to me, right? And that's a way of sort of emphasizing and pushing down other people into that projected K-minus position in order to motivate your uh, conversational contribution. This is something that Heritage thinks is absolutely pervasive um, in conversation. He thinks every single turn at talk, which has clausal content, so we've gotten beyond hello, um, and which uh, is not just an imperative, has to be motivated by positing some kind of epistemic disparity between speaker and addressee. Um, and then what happens after that is that the epistemic disparity has to be somehow reduced or resolved um, by the ensuing talk. Uh, okay, so so this is this is sort of how the theory works. Any turn that formulates a K plus K minus imbalance between participants will warrant the production of talk that redresses the imbalance. Um, so Heritage thinks either type of gradient starts this sort of epistemic seesaw motion that will tend to drive interactional sequences until a claim of equilibrium for all practical purposes is registered by the person who had previously assumed or was assumed to be in that K minus position. Now you might be wondering, OK, so this idea that you've got to keep positing a gradient, you've got to keep um, sort of moving back and forth on the seesaw, does that apply also to solo conversation? Like, does it apply also to monologues? Does it apply also to what I'm doing right now? Um, or to philosophical texts in which, you, you know, looks like there's just one voice? Uh, I think the answer there is actually also yes, that in order to derive motivation, um, which, to be honest, sometimes starts flagging in lectures, especially long lectures. But in order to derive motivation, I have to keep asking a question, right? And then taking steps to answer it, right? Where even, even though I might be asking a question to which presumably I should be knowing the answer, right? I have to kind of simulate some kind of interaction. Or think of the way that philosophical texts are structured, even in the, in the voice of a single author. What we have to do to get motivation going is we have to uh, imagine an interlocutor. Here, one might object to that, right? And you've got to have that kind of simulated uh, interaction in order to have a sense of motivation in the, uh, in, the, in the text. Notice also that when I project someone else as K plus, for example, by asking the question, there's a couple of different things that they can do to redress the imbalance. One of the things they can do is answer my question and then I, having shifted from not knowing to knowing on the point of question, can give them a signal that they've succeeded. Another thing they can do, though, is they can uh, rebuff or reject the status that I have projected onto them. Right? I ask them a question, they can answer, I don't know. 
right? And then that's another way in which the imbalance goes away, because now we're both openly declared as K minus on that point. There's no disparity between us. There's no motivation to continue just in conversation there. We have to maybe find a fresh topic, related topic. We could engage in joint inquiry at that point. Um, but just testimonial transfer isn't going to work if neither of us knows the answer. OK, so in heritage's theory, we have the idea that giving and receiving information are normative warrants for talking, monitored accordingly, kept track of minutely and publicly. Uh, it could, in principle, be different, uh, but it is not. All right, so that's the theory. So um, just to underscore one more time, we've got these success signals that we're producing, right? So if I start out with a K plus initiation, here I am, I'm going to tell you something. Um, at some point, you've got to produce some kind of epistemic change of state marker. You've got to somehow acknowledge, nod, or smile, recognize that you've heard something. If, I'm, if this is going to be a successful episode of uh, of knowledge transfer that you've been switched to K plus on the point in question. Or you've got to resist me, and then we'll start another seesaw exchange, maybe going in the other direction. Um, if I have a K minus interaction, so uh, initiation, so I'm asking something, um, you can either answer me, which is going to uh, confirm my conjecture that you had knowledge on this point. Um, and typically, that would switch me into being in that shared K plus position, so now we're even. Um, and I would have to acknowledge that with a change of state marker. Notice there's this asymmetry. It's the person who was originally or was projected to be in that K minus knowledge lacking position um, who has to indicate that we're good now. Um, this is an old idea, going back to Harvey Sachs. The person who asks the questions is actually the person who's in control of the conversation, right? And also true in a sense in. Um, speech of the kind that I'm engaging in here, right? So to the extent that I am asking the question, um, I'm in control of which way this is going. And incidentally, I'm looking forward to relinquishing this role. When we get into question period, you get to answer the questions. OK, so, um, so we've got these overtly signaled um, K plus, K minus imbalances. Those will continue until equilibrium is found. Uh, and, and until equilibrium is acknowledged by that person who is in the knowledge lacking position, either we're going to both move up to sharing knowledge or we're going to both move down to acknowledging that neither of us has it. Um, this is not exactly something that other animals are doing. So they share information, um, but they don't share information about the shifting epistemic gradient between them. That's uniquely human. Um, we get subtle forms of cooperation, like mutual correction. Um, we also, of course, move into the territory of strategic deception. That's uniquely human. Uh, or even skepticism, which we'll talk about on Friday. OK, so you've got an actual set of things you know. That's going to be your actual epistemic territory. That doesn't necessarily line up with your perceived epistemic territory, what the relevant audience is going to see you as knowing. Um, so you can make mistakes about things that are close to you, your pets, your plans. Um, I think I'm going to go to, for dinner with you, but you know I might be hit by a bus. Uh, we can also know things that don't lie within the territory that other people will instinctively grant to us. Maybe because they're improbable, maybe because they're things that um, people wouldn't expect us to know. Uh, so I should say actually the first the first kind of the first kind of error the first kind of discrepancy between real and recognized epistemic territory is interesting but not uniquely social. It's actually very similar to um, the kind of difficulty we have when we maybe instinctively trust our senses. And we happen, in this case, to be, uh, to be confused. I'll talk about that on Thursday. This second kind actually is distinctively social. So I want to focus on that now. So if there's something that I know, but you're not going to instinctively recognize me as knowing, um, for example, anything at all within philosophy, right? You're going, to, uh, you're going to want me to argue for it, almost anything within philosophy. Uh, so if I want to enlarge my perceived epistemic territory, uh, 
or get to something that lies beyond my perceived epistemic territory, what I'm going to need to do is argue or reason explicitly on the basis of already trusted premises. Um, and that's something that I'll do even if the thing that I know that I'm trying to persuade you of is uh, something that I learned through perception or through testimony, even if it's not something that I learned on the basis of argument. Uh, and here I'm very much indebted to the work of Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber, who think that our capacity for explicit reasoning or argumentation evolved as a solution to the cheap signaling problem. So other animals can send each other signals, but they're very restricted. So bees, for example, can signal only a very restricted range of facts about nectar. Um, peacocks can signal their fitness, um, but the fitness of a peacock is, uh, is something that it can signal, although it's very costly for it to signal its fitness by its you know, display of this magnificent tail, which an unfit animal couldn't display. Um, with the flexibility of our language, we can send signals with almost any content at virtually no cost. Uh, and of course, if we can do this very freely, then there's a risk that we might abuse the power that we've got uh, and send signals which are to our own particular advantage and not to the joint advantage of ourselves and our, and our fellow men. Um, so Mercier and Sperber have a theory that, um, that one, one way we can get over this problem is by having a shared sense among members of our species of what would constitute a valid argument. And they have some interesting empirical work that suggests that we do actually have uh, some shared sense of the validity of arguments. And then also um, a capacity to argue for our claims by showing that they follow from uh, premises which the interlocutor uh, either knows already or is willing to take on trust from you as a speaker. With that capacity, you can radically extend the range of things that you can successfully communicate. Mercier and Sperber think that the function of this is, again, just to coordinate beliefs among members of our species. So it's very advantageous for us uh, to be able to persuade each other um, so that we can come into social alignment with each other um, I'm interested in the idea that perhaps a uh, deeper function that can be served by this capacity is to, uh, is to build knowledge. OK, so we have a sort of territorial calculation that we engage in. Uh, it's something that can help us decide, when can I just tell you something? I can tell you something when I anticipate that you're going to perceive it as being within my instinctively assigned epistemic territory. Um, and I can also use that calculation to figure out when am I going to have to argue for something? When am I going to have to fight for it? Of course, I could always just tell you something uh, and wait for your acceptance or resistance. Um, of course, being able to calculate different people's epistemic territory can also guide you in lying, guide you in strategic deception, figuring out what you can get away with, what people, if you can't lie to someone very easily about something uh, that they know better than you do. Um, there can be potential advantages to that. There can also be disadvantages uh, in a cooperatively, socially maintained um, system of, uh, of reputation management. But where I actually want to end here uh, is with a, with, a, with, a sli with a slightly different issue, um, which is the issue of whether we ever calculate our own epistemic territory. So we spend a lot of time just figuring out stuff about the world. To what extent do we ever turn to think about the question of what does or doesn't lie within the realm of things that I know? Now, if you take that basic idea of epistemic territory as being, yeah, that's what I'm going to take on trust without any argument, do we do this for ourselves ever? One uh, point that is actually related to this is the question of whether you actually ever explicitly question yourself. Do you ever actually stop and ask yourself a question and force yourself to answer? Um, this does seem to be something that we do. You can ask yourself a question as a way of trying to um, bring up to consciousness what it is that you hold to be true on a given point. You can ask yourself a question in a weird way. Um, 
uh, in, in a weird way, it can be similar to actually asking another person uh, to uh, asking another person a question. And notice also that even in private thought, you can switch from just trusting the first thing that comes into your head, uh, the first thing you seem to remember, um, to you can switch from that. Mom call that intuitive cognition. You can switch from that to reflective cognition, where you start thinking twice and you start wondering about what really happens. So, so you might, um, uh, if I ask you to remember what you had for breakfast, have uh, a you know instant picture or image or um, some little story um, that you're just going to take on trust. If for some reason this becomes a very high stakes matter, you become very self conscious about it. You can start um, reasoning explicitly about it. Start remembering the moment when you were making the coffee. Start reviewing all the details of what happened. You can also start thinking argumentatively, if it's the right kind of thing that I've asked you about. Um, when stakes are high, uh, or when you encounter incongruities. Even for yourself, you can switch from just telling yourself and trusting yourself um, to a mode of thought in which you are questioning yourself, interrogating yourself, forcing yourself to engage in explicit reasoning. Here's a, here's a, a last question in this talk, which is the question of how far that kind of self-questioning can go, right? Because it seems like even when you break things into parts and start to look for premises um, to support the conclusions that you take yourself to hold, um, you're still taking some kind of trusting attitude towards those premises themselves, right? It seems like there's some kind of limit to how far, uh, how far self-questioning could proceed. Um, tomorrow and Thursday, we are going to look in more detail at what happens when you start calculating your own epistemic territory. Thank you. When you were speaking about K minus and K plus and yeah. going from one to the other, you were talking most of the time as if like someone, you say something that you're supposed to be more knowledgeable about. I end up saying something that challenges that, and it moves. You were speaking a lot as if it was like moving from like a binary from K plus to K minus, but you're, it's gradable. So I'm curious what that gradability like corresponds to when it actually comes to knowledge. Um, so, or I guess part of the question is, does the great ability come when it has to do with knowing, or does it, the great ability come with something more like what I expect you to know, or what people would expect you to know? Because it seems like in actual knowledge itself, at least on some views, like knowledge isn't all that gradable. You know it or you don't. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what that great ability amounts to when it comes to like the mental state that I happen to be in if I'm moving up or down in the gradient? OK, um, so that's a great question. Um, the way this literature talks about it, which I think is perfectly correct, is that um, the full K plus position is actually some kind of absolute. Uh, and then the shades of being away from that are where the, are, are where the gradation comes in. Um, so, to just take that question about marital status, right? If I say, you're married, aren't you? Or something like that. Um, that is a state which uh, is closer to the state of knowledge than the state in which I say, are you married? I have no idea at all, right? So, so it could be that having a certain level of confidence is pulling you in the direction, in the direction of knowing. Um, and but you could you you can you can, you can be absolutely ignorant or you can be in some position on the gradient which is approximating a state of knowledge. Now one of the sort of very interesting questions is what happens when you have a conversation between two parties, both of whom uh, have some kind of partial state, right? And um, and those kinds of conversations are. Um, those kinds of conversations are 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 are, are, are very are very interesting, right? And 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 actually, maybe even um, maybe even those are conversations in which 
um, something extra emerges from the interactivity between the participants than you would get in ordinary conversations in which just one party is knowledgeable and the other isn't. Uh, so in particular, I'm thinking of the work of people like Bard or Brahmi and Chris Frith, where they're, um, they're looking at teams of people who have to make very subtle perceptual judgments. And they very quickly move to start spontaneously sharing with each other not only their judgment, but their level of confidence in it. And they very quickly move towards deferring, if these are judgments to be made by teams of two, for example, deferring to the person with greater confidence. And that seems to be a strategy which brings the accuracy of the dyad higher than um, either participant taken taken on their own. So there there can, there can be there can be sort of very very interesting very subtle um, situations in which in which you can get some kind of epistemic gain from conversations between people who are who are uh, who are not who are not exactly in a state of knowledge. Um, so I don't want to sort of convey the idea that the only way you can get epistemic gain is from knowledge flowing from the knowledgeable person to somebody who somebody who isn't. There can be there can be sort of subtler subtler forms of epistemic gain. Usually what people are saying in those cases though is something that they do actually know. So there's um, I'm thinking in particular these tasks are um, tasks where you have to uh, for example tell which of a set of visually presented patches has a little bit of an anomaly in it. And so people will usually say something like I think that it might be the one on the left or something like that. And that kind of expression of, uh, of their own thought or their own state of mind or their own, I'm inclined to say that it was the one on the top or something like that, they are actually expressing something that they know to be the case, right? That their own feeling is something that's presenting to them, to them as knowledge. And then the two parties are able to make progress by sort of putting together um, their states of confidence. Uh, they can make progress towards the underlying real world task of figuring out the answer to the perceptual puzzle. Right. I actually had the same question. I forgot to ask you that. I'm not quite sure what the answer is. These different grades of like E minus, these are, and in, in, you know, this thing about this kind of gain. So is it, the gradation is not like justification or warrant, it's comp Confidence, it's a whole mess of these things, or is it not determinate? What's being tracked? What, what are the levels of K minus? Um, uh, okay, so one of the things that we're indicating is our, is our epistemic stance. So we might want to communicate to the other person, not only I take you to be knowledgeable on this question, which is why I'm asking you, but we might want to communicate to the other person that I am completely unaware on this question, and I take you to be fairly knowledgeable. Or I might want to communicate to you, um, my state is falling a little short of knowledge on this. Can you, uh, can, you, can you just bring me up a little way to knowledge? Right? So I don't, so, and I might want to do that, for example, if you think of that doctor patient case, right? It seems like from the perspective of efficiency, why doesn't the doctor always ask every single question, full interrogative syntax, rise and intonation? Are you married? You know, why, why would she ever say, you're married, aren't you? Why would she ever do that? It seems like that is a move where there is some uh, affiliation or rapport. She's seen this patient multiple times before. She wants to indicate my epistemic status with respect to you as a patient is, well, I'm not completely clear. Right, she might, for, for reasons of maintaining that relationship, want to signal that she doesn't have no idea at all. At the same time, she is taking a history, so she wants the patient's confirmation on, on that point. Right? So there's, there's, there's all kinds of reasons you might have for wanting to s not just signal that there's an epistemic gradient, but send a signal about how deep or how shallow the epistemic gradient is. Um, What's between the gradient, the other gradient part. Measuring it's measuring itself? something like distance from knowledge, and I'm not giving you any more detailed theory right now of what that. No, th thank you for that. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not giving you any more detailed theory of what exactly that gradient amounts to. Right. So uh, yeah, I think 
In particular, you might be worried, am I going to get into a position where there's got to be a gray zone between truth and falsity or something like that? And I don't, I don't want to have anything like that. Um, I think of knowledge as being a mental state which one can only have towards truths. And you get further away from that, the more it's the case that your mental state could be of a type that is not just directed towards truths. Um, but, but I'm very open-ended about the ways in which you can diverge from that state of knowledge. Uh, yeah, and I'll say, I'll say more about it tomorrow. Alex? Um, I had a question about this notion of uh, is that epistemic territory. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I'm asking this because it might make a difference to how to interpret the subsequent lectures. It might also be irrelevant. So, we'll okay. see. Um, so one way of thinking of epistemic territory is like um, something about your ability to know something. Like, a, like you're in a position to know. So if you're at the party and I wasn't, and I say he was there, mm -hmm. um, then if we both know that, well, I wasn't, we both know that I wasn't there and you were there, then it would sound more like a question than if right. um, I was there and you weren't there. Um, um, so that could be a measure or an indication of like your actual ability to know. Or another way of thinking about epistemic territory might be much more normative. It might be more about what, what you ought to know um, and what somebody else shouldn't know or something like this. Um, so there, there might be expectations that you know um, that you should know. You're the, you're the kind of person who should know that kind of thing. Yeah. And so then it's not a measure of whether you in fact know. It's more, more an indication of kind of given your social location of some kind, then you ought to. Uh, and I wonder whether one should think of epistemic territories as more like one of these two things than the other, or whether it's a mixture of the two and they're very tightly yeah. connected. So in, in the sociology literature, these two domains are often just run together. Uh, and I think they're run together because they are equally concerned with um, the territory that you have and the territory that you're perceived as having, and those are not always split apart. As an epistemologist, I want to maintain a very sharp distinction between them. I say your epistemic territory is whatever you do in fact know. Um, whether or not other people recognize you as knowing it, whether or not you normatively ought to know it, um, your territory is what you do in fact know. Uh, I think it's actually also very interesting what territory you're ordinarily perceived as having uh, or other people would expect you to have. Uh, and I would, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the question invites a big sort of asterisk beside a lot of these um, uh, results that people like Stivers and Heritage are trying to get out of the, uh, out of the questions about you know, marital status or whatever, that, um, that actually a really good question is whether when someone says something, declarative, falling intonation, do you hear it as a question? Um, because, yeah, as a matter of fact, that is squarely in my epistemic territory. Or do you hear it as a question because you're like, yes, for that person, that is something that they would sure situate within my territory. I think in most cases, those things don't come apart. But in cases, which is why I've been treating them as if they don't come apart, but in cases where they do come apart, um, especially if it's anything kind of sensitive, I secretly, I was not supposed to be at that party, the party at the, you know, the, at the party at the, uh, at the all men's club last night that I wasn't supposed to have witnessed. Secretly, I was there in disguise, but I'm trying very much to hide that thing. You know, like if it's any, if it's any kind of situation where I know something that I'm not supposed to know, um, then I will be sort of more reflective in my conversational encounters as we get close to that. Um, to that sensitive point, and I think I would hear you as asking or questioning on the basis of what I take to be your uh, presumption about my knowledge. Either that, or I'd start worrying that I've been found out. Um, but I think I think it's uh, I think it's a very good point that those things could start coming apart, and uh, and they'll come apart just in these cases where uh, I start worrying or even recognizing that uh, you're presumed conception of my 
epistemic territory is going to differ from what the territory actually is. For the most part, we're not, even, we're not even aware of this. We're not even paying attention to this just because we so much share our common conception of what people are and are not going to know, right? And this is how conversations can have such a formulaic character, how there can be safe topics, how you can, you know, you call up your distant parent on the phone and you have this sort of move where you're talking about the weather at your relative locations. And, and the reason that you can do that is it's kind of because it's, it's going to be news to the other person, not telling them something they already knew. And it's, a, it's safe because it's mutually recognized. This is, this is my territory. This is where, where I am now. So you can, you can have that sort of comfort in conversation probably because we do have so much the shared consumption of what people do and don't know. And in, a, sorry. in a social situation with different parties, um, with different grades of knowledge, does a speaker set on a specific epistemic territory, territory or um, he varies on conversational register on sort of a collective epistemic territory when he speaks? Like a collective model? Or? Okay, um, so we certainly, as we start speaking to each other, as we start engaging on a topic, um, I have to start with the idea that there's some disparity between us on the topic. Otherwise, I don't know whether I'm going to ask you or tell you. Now, sometimes if I'm really uncertain about that, I might do some sort of pre-authorization move. Like, I might start at, do you know whether, you know, I might start testing the waters before I start then telling you, or have you heard. Um, but it seems like we're going to start with me having a picture of your epistemic position, which has got to be to motivate the conversation and contribution different from mine, either up or down from it. Now, when we start getting into a conversation with each other, um, as soon as we are building up a common ground in conversation, we will both represent each other as knowing a bunch of things in common. And then when I start referring to an object, I can refer to it with the to indicate that it's something that is that we've spoken about before, that is a mutually known prior referent. Um, we can go on and make additional conversational moves together because we have this sort of shared body of knowledge between us in the conversation, or what's perceived as a shared body of, of knowledge between us in the conversation. Again, it could be that both of us are mistaken by taking each other to be knowledgeable, um, but but how do I say that we we start with needing to have some kind of discrepancy in knowledge between the conversational participants. We also start with thinking that there is a great deal that we have in common and knowing that there's a great deal that we have in common. I take for granted your shared access to our shared perceptual space here, right? that we both know about it. And this is how I can you know, make, uh, make reference to objects that are within the shared space. right? That's part of the, uh, that's part of the grounding of our conversation. But like on the particular topic where I'm launching in either with a question or with a telling, I've got to think that there has to be that some kind of moment of disparity between us that I'm, that I'm pausing, positing to motivate my, my conversational turn. Uh, as soon as the disparity is resolved, if it's resolved in the direction of us both coming up to being capable on the issue, then that goes into the body of things that we have in common as shared knowledge in the conversation as the conversation moves forward. We can later come back and revisit it if we discover that later that there's a problem and then we realize, oh my god, we didn't know that thing, right? We can go back and erase it, but otherwise we will, we will start moving things into this um, shared body of common knowledge. Okay. So is it, this is kind of a follow-up on what Brian and I were asking, but I'm just curious if like, this way of understanding the potential gradability would be like a way of thinking about it. So at least in like semantics and pragmatic circles, often like within conversation, there's some type of question under discussion at that level, and like that isn't like one single thing, it's like a stack of all of the things that are relevant to that are mm -hmm. included under the question under discussion, can be pretty broad or pretty narrow depending on what our conversation is going like. So it'd be like something that our K, where, where we fall in the K minus to plus scale could correspond to like the amount of knowledge we have on the answers to the questions under discussion. So 
and the, like the cluster of propositions and the cluster of questions all around this one thing we're talking about, I know a lot of it. So I'm pretty high up on the scale, whereas you like know a couple of things. So the knowledge set of you within that question and discussion is pretty low, and like that is a way of thinking of where I fall on this scale. So it's not like the great ability isn't about knowledge of a single proposition. It's like your knowledge set of certain types of things. Because like, cause I, I guess like that type of great ability makes a lot of sense to me. And yeah. I, I guess before I was kind of thinking of it like, well, the great ability is on a knowledge about a single proposition. But that seems like, no, epistemic territory is so much broader than that. So is this like more like question under discussion set of propositionally things, would that be a way of understanding it? Or is that like too thinking of in terms of like semantics and philosophy of language than the, the type of way you're thinking about? Okay, so I think that this is a really interesting proposal and it's sort of going to depend on how you're thinking of um, how you're going to think of topic selection, right? If you're going to think of topic selection broadly or in terms of a more narrowly defined question. I think it could be compatible with the framework that um, Heritage and others are advancing within constitutional analysis that, that, that you would think of the great, great ability in terms of expertise and topic broadly, uh, broadly construed, although the particular examples that they give are almost always examples of very particular propositions uh, with respect to which either knowledge is possessed by one party and not at all by the other, or knowledge is possessed by one party, and something that is maybe to s in some way approximating knowledge is possessed by the other. So maybe the other party has some level of confidence, but they don't. Uh, they don't actually know. Okay. So here's uh, why it could be problematic is that so it seems hard to sort of see where we reach the same level. So for example, the the coffee example that yes. you brought up earlier. So you don't know whether I had coffee with my wife, child. I'm going to tell you I did, but I know so many, so, so much more about this particular situation. Yeah. Like what the phone was like, yeah, was there yeah. milk and so on. How it bitter seems, was it? <laughs> yeah, so it seems that I always, yeah. so if, if that's the way to go, then it seems that you would ne really never reach my level, sort of like at the K minus yeah. plus station. Yeah. So that might be a problem for this kind of uh, proposal. Right, because it does seem like the conversational interaction is over and we're done. Uh, when I ask you the question, you give me the answer, I say, oh, thanks, right? We're supposed to achieve equilibrium, right? So it, it's really going to depend, like, what's our, what is our purpose in this, in this conversation? Do I want to know everything about that coffee, or do I just want to know the binary fact of whether or not you consume coffee for some, uh, for some reason? Yeah, so that would be a good reason just to keep the... Uh, just one proposition. Or yes, keep the, gradient, keep the gradient under control, that once we, uh, certainly once we hit that sort of K plus position on that on that one question. Um, as far as that one question is concerned, um, we have, for all practical purposes, achieved equilibrium. Uh, but the practical purposes seem to play actually a fairly significant role. So if I'm if I'm a really an expert in a certain field, so you might want to say that I mean I do know this proposition better. I will. I mean uh, this is not going to. I mean just one conversation is not going to uh, get. Uh, someone else at my to my level, mm -hmm. and so you might so it seems that the practical purpose is sort of like the equilibrium is very much determined by by you know the time we have, so my intentions, so all the, all these sort of pragmatic. Things. Okay, so there could be like further and more subtle questions I could be asking you about your cup of coffee, right? And depending on the purpose of my engaging in the conversation at all, I might or might not want to ask those questions. But if we go back to sort of the overarching purpose of conversation, uh, I guess there's multiple purposes, including affiliation building and so on. But, um, but if you think of the purpose of knowledge sharing as maybe, in a lot of cases, having to do with um, joint actions that we might undertake, um, it will certainly be the case in a lot of situations that, uh, that just a fairly minimal answer will give me all the knowledge that I need for my practical purpose, right? I just want to know what time the party starts. And maybe I don't need to know all the other sort of fine details about what's going to ha happen at the party or anything like that uh, for, my, for my immediate practical purposes. 
Um, I think that my question is slightly similar to Patrick. I just want a little bit more um, clarification. So when you say that um, if we're talking about broader topics and something that might have like a set of propositions in it, yes. then um, like two people having a conversation might be on a similar level of K minus, like at the beginning of the conversation, but their knowledge is like qualitatively different in some way. Then is it like more? Is it better to um, like reduce um, the the topic to like this very narrow thing, and then say that person A is like K plus on this, and person B is K minus on that, and like each sub proposition would be like sort of differently created in that sense. Oh, okay, this is a really interesting question, because I think some of the most productive conversations are conversations where yeah. you and I each have partial knowledge, right? You and I each have partial knowledge of you know, what happened at the party last night, right? I was upstairs, you were downstairs, and we can somehow put together, yeah. Yeah. even though we were both partially ignorant at the beginning. Ideally, we're putting together what we know. Ideally, we're not uh, dragging each other down. I'm going to give you my misconceptions, you're going to give me yours, and we'll both end up knowing less than we did before the conversation began. Um, so, so yeah, I think um, those cases in which two people have partial ignorance within a domain are cases where the exchange of information is most obviously uh, effective and, and productive and also interesting. Uh, usually. I mean, I, I like to think of uh, philosophical conversations as always having the structure that philosophy is so difficult that no one walks down at just being sort of knowledgeable on, on all points, right? Um, I think all of us in philosophy have quite a few misconceptions, and the question is how we can come together as conversants and actually get the best out of each other, actually extract from each participant in the exchange some of the sort of particular things that they know that the other parties don't. I, mean, I think this is always more commerce, like, question period is always so much more interesting than the talk, right? Because you do have that sort of interaction between um, people who have come at the problem from different perspectives with different things that they will know better than the speaker. Um, yeah, thanks. Right. Brian and Patrick's question. Um, so I was thinking, uh, so Patrick was putting forth this idea that there's great gradation in expertise, and that might be what the, the scale of the plus minus k is. And I was thinking, based on what I can remember about the, this literature, like one way of describing that spectrum would be to what extent are you in a position to know something? So are you, is it possible for you to have known something? So you could just not be in a position to know about it. You could be in a position to know about it. And then there's some, some situations where it's really difficult to deny that you know it. Yeah. Right? So it's kind of the inversion of philosoph philosophical skepticism, where you find it difficult to, to show that you don't know it. Um, and then I, I wonder whether when that overlaps with the expertise scale, but it kind of accentuates the role of your environment to a greater extent about whether you were at the party or not, or for these kinds of things. So it's another candidate for the uh, understanding this scale that seemed, like, when, from what I can remember from reading the, the, some of this literature, that that sounded to me like the kind of thing that they had in mind. Um, yeah. So, okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, I, actually, so this literature also looks at um, courtroom conversations, in particular cross-examination. Uh, uh, in great detail, and those give you excellent uh, examples of situations in which um, the prosecuting attorney is going to be saying something along the lines of, you couldn't possibly not have known that <laughs> such and such actually obtained. I'm actually kind of interested in this locution of being in a position to know something, right? Because that's suggestive also of cases in which you can ask somebody a question and suppose that they are in a position to know it, but they don't actually know it at that moment. So often, um, like, you know, I can ask, uh, ask my son, who's a mathematics uh, student, I can ask him a question in mathematics to which um, he, that he's in a position to know, that is, he can at that point figure it out and produce an answer for me. So conversation isn't just about getting out from people, well, what are the things that you know, give me. Um, it's also perhaps reaching beyond that, recognizing you as a person who is in, is in a position to 
no thanks. I can actually get more out of you than more out of you than that. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's a good observation. Thank you. This may seem weird, but it's a, this whole topic, you've been using the notion of knowledge to fill various yes. uh, functions. And it, in terms of uh, epistemic markers and all that. Um, but I'm thinking of scenarios in which it's like that, that game that we're playing. This game that we're playing uh, would perform this function even though we have very little knowledge. So I was thinking, you know, imagine possible open skepticism is true, or imagine possible world in which uh, various error theories and uh, metaphysics or something are true, so that most of our beliefs are false. Or imagine a possible world in which we take a whole bunch of people who are adults and we uh, BID them, and but put them in in communication with one another. So they're having conversations, but they've all been recently embedded. So that seems to be a scenario in which a lot of people think that these people don't know things. Like don't, they don't know that there's a left turn there, because there is no left turn there. There are a bunch of BIVs, and there's no left turn in the room, and things like that. So these seem to be cases where these conversations, the epistemic marker, the use of the epistemic markers and such, is still performing the function. But it's not in terms of knowledge because the participants don't have knowledge. So that kind of maybe that suggests that knowledge is not the thing that's like being selected for or something like that. Okay, um, I love this question, uh, and I promise you I'll talk about uh, about skepticism more on Thursday. But I will say that recently invented BIDs actually do have knowledge. They have a great deal of knowledge uh, of their past. Right, but, uh, but we could be talking about and where we're going to eat, what we just did 10 minutes ago, and that thing. Okay, so, so my position on what's going on with the recently invented BIDs is potentially a little bit different from, from yours. So if the recently invented BIDs are genuinely in interactive exchange with each other, and if they're capable of acting, that is, if they're capable, for example, as I seem to be, of approaching the lectern and having it, having it appear differently from different angles, and you would also be capable of doing, of doing that, I think, um, I think they actually do have knowledge of the lectern being there between them. The ultimate metaphysical character of that knowledge is a little bit eyebrow raising, or the not, sorry, the ultimate metaphysical character character of the lectern uh, is perhaps not what they might think it to be. Um, right. But if they're so they both have true interacting... They have knowledge, but the lectern is a virtual, not lectern. Yeah, yeah, you could, oh, you could go for something, you could yeah. go for something like, like that. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's really, really interesting to actually even just throw out the idea of imagine a possible world in which skepticism is true. Uh, I think that's... Uh, that's a very, very interesting stipulation, and uh, it might or might not be ultimately coherent as, right. as a stipulation. I was thinking of a possible world in which uh, compositional nihilism in metaphysics is true, so that there are no composite objects. And so, you know, when we say things like, you know, there's 10 trees in my backyard, yeah. that's just false. Yeah. Because there are no trees. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Of course, you could say that those are incoherent as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, those get to be those get to be very very interesting worlds to, yeah. to say the least. So, but thanks for the question. Okay, let us finish here today.